Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is our good friend, Steve Penny from The Silver Chartist. Steve, thank you so much for joining us today. You bet, Elijah. Thanks for inviting me back. It's been uh, it's been too long, so I look forward to a good conversation today. Definitely really been looking forward to this. Uh, two quick things before we start. So first, uh, if our viewers are interested in signing up for your uh, free newsletter, they can go to silverchartistliberty.com. Link is also in the description, so they'll be supporting Liberty and Finance along the way there as well. And second as well, I did want to uh, talk about what we're seeing right now. So um, we do have uh, the ability of viewers actually to submit questions. So just submit it in the live chat box right there and we'll hopefully uh, answer them on air. The first topic I did want to discuss though is what we're seeing right now was incredibly bullish for precious metals. And you said that it seems like smart money is buying hand over fist, buying silver hand over fist. Can you expand on that? Yeah, and I, I tr try and not use dramatic language like that, but it, it's true. I mean, if you look at the commitment of traders report, that shows you what literally what the smart money is doing in the futures market. I'm talking about JP Morgan, the big banks. What were they doing back on March 8th of uh, earlier this year? They were they were uh, heavily short to this market. So they, they, they uh, profited on this pullback. Well, what are they doing now? It's the polar opposite of before we had this brutal sell-off. They've been covering shorts and buying hand over fist on this pullback. Now, the COT is not a perfect uh, timing indicator, <clears throat> but what it does do is tell you if you're in like the buy zone or the sell zone. And often when you're at a setup like this, it, it would be a historic anomaly for a significant rally to not follow in the, the months ahead with the COT set up this way. And that's the futures market. Uh, and you would know probably be better than me, but uh, premiums on physical, people are scooping up physical hand over fist as well. So, you know, smart money is buying. That doesn't mean that we turn around and rally to the moon tomorrow, but I think we're clearly, clearly in the buy zone. So I think anything under $20 in silver uh, is just an absolute gift. I think it definitely is. And as, as you mentioned, premiums, yeah, here at Miles Franklin, they and across the industry, premiums have remained high. And interestingly, that goes both ways. So the buyback premiums are quite high, especially when look, you look at Silver Eagles. So there's a kind of interesting opportunity there where you can get $10 above the price of silver right now on Silver Eagles for a swap into another uh, form of silver or other metal. So that's just a, a historic um, premium we're seeing there on buybacks. Your perspective on that, that it seems like, yeah, there's this continuing divergence between the physical and paper market. Yeah, that's just the nature of it until it breaks, until it no longer works. But like the the if you and I go look at, hey, what's the price of silver today? What we're seeing is a price set on supply and demand of paper contracts that are bought and sold and created at will on the commodities exchange. Um, if all of our listeners, if you know, millions of us went out and bought all, all the silver that we possibly could, it wouldn't affect the price at all because the physical market and the paper market are two different things. Um, and that, that's why we're seeing those premiums where you can you know, you want to get your hand on a silver eagle, it's probably over 30 bucks. Definitely. And when it comes to the market that we're seeing right now, at least the paper market, it seems like today we're seeing quite a bit of a pullback in silver and gold. What's your take on what's happening right now? Yeah, I think this is healthy. We've had a really nice bounce here, especially in silver. So nothing goes straight up. Um, you know, things ebb and flow. Um, so what we're looking for is higher highs and higher lows. What we don't want to see is a lower low. The recent low was $18 and one cent. Um, so as long as we make a higher low above 18, the, the things look, I, I'm optimistic that we have seen the lows and that the worst is behind us. And interestingly, for anyone who looks closely at charts, you know, I don't, I don't use a lot of indicators, but I do put the 50 day moving average and the 200 day moving average, uh, overlaid on a daily chart. And you can see right now today, we're Right, right at that 50-day moving average. That's where we pulled back to. And that's significant because you know, um, institutional trading algorithms, big money, they use those moving averages. So you know, it would be nice to see this 50-day moving average hold. So today could be a nice buying opportunity. And definitely. And when it comes to investing in physical precious metals, we have a question here from Edward and your perspective on this. What's the point of buying precious metals when premiums are so high and the price can get manipulated back down? Uh, so what's the point of buying? I think it sounds like two-part question. So first of all, what's the point of buying precious metals? There's many reasons, but first and foremost, it's an insurance policy against uh, reckless you know, governments or 
wh wherever you may live. Um, you know, tell that to the people in Venezuela right now. Um, I, I, if they don't have some physical metal, I'm sure that um, I bet they sh sure wish they did. And if they would like to don't have some, but would like to get it, good luck. You know, there's no way they can get it right now. So first of all, it's an insurance policy. And then second of all, it can be uh, there over long periods of time, precious metals tend to make terrible investments. However, there are brief periods in the cycle where they can make fantastic speculations. And in a short period of time, you can make up for all of that, you know, past poor performance, just like in 2011, in March of 2020. And all of the signs are pointing to that in the months ahead, we're very likely to see a fantastic rally in silver. So you can use it for insurance and you, uh, a vehicle to speculate in. Definitely. I think to answer the question about the high premiums, often you'll see like a 10%, maybe maybe 20% premium in the physical silver, but the premiums also are high sometimes on the buybacks as well. So you don't necessarily need a huge move in silver to, to then be able to sell uh, higher than you bought it for. But when it comes to what you're looking for in the um, in the price of silver, can it, we can you share the charts with us and what you're looking for in the near future? Yeah, absolutely. Let me go ahead and share my screen here. There it is. Yeah, so let me find that silver chart. There it is. So this is a longer term chart. This goes back to 2019. And there's really nothing cosmic about this chart. The first thing I look for whenever I look at a chart is, um, first of all, are we? It, what's the trend? So are we up or down? And you can see here, there is no trend. We're just sideways between, you know, around $20 and $30 on the upside. And then secondly, is there any clear patterns that can give us some, uh, you know, good idea of where the price is headed next? And there's really no clear patterns here. But what I do see when I look at this chart is we were deeply oversold. Um, the, as oversold as you, you know, you only see this level of technical uh, being oversold, you know, every handful of years, if that. So the last time where this oversold was March 2020. And that was right against major support at $18. So a bounce was very likely here. And we're seeing that. So the next resistance is 2150 to 22. That was previous support. So getting above that next hurdle will be the you know next step towards confirming a technical reversal in silver. But from a bigger picture perspective, I think anything below $20 is just an absolute bargain. And why is that $20 level so critical? Well, it's just a psychological level. I mean, silver is the only commodity on the planet that's trading less than where it was back in 1980, over 40 years ago. And not only is it less, it's less than half. Um, just, so just that alone shows just how historically undervalued silver is. And you look at a time where is silver uh, supply increasing? No, it's decreasing. Um, is demand decreasing? No, demand is increasing, um, not just from investors, but in industry and in solar panels and all of these uh, battery metals and think, or excuse me, uh, batteries, electrification. So the, the setup, if you're looking for a value, you know, wh where's the value? I, silver is the most undervalued asset on the planet right now. We have a viewer here wanting to know about if silver does break above that 1980 high of $50, where will it go from there? He asks, if silver breaks out to $50 or so, is it going to stay broken out this time? Or is it going to go right back down to $15 like it did back in 2015? So my crystal ball is broken. So I don't know the future with precision. But my I high, strongly suspect that $50 will not be that that high will be taken out. Um, we could probably run up to towards 50, see a meaningful pullback. And then once we break through it a second time, that uh, that becomes support. And I think we're going to see, uh, you know, triple digit silver in the years ahead. They may sound, sound ridiculous when we're down here around 20. But, you know, if history is any guide, uh, triple digit silver is coming. So I, I don't think we're going to run up towards 50 and then pull back to 15 again. I, I view that as a very, very low probability outcome. Now, when it comes to gold, what are you seeing right now? Uh, gold is held up much better than silver, um, but it's also more susceptible to, um, I, I think the lows are very likely in for both gold and silver, but I have more conviction in making that statement with silver than gold. And one reason is the structure of the COT report. Um, it's, it's bullish, but it's not as like historically extreme as that for silver. Um, it is bullish, but you know, it's not that major historic extreme. And then you can see the chart for gold here. Uh, we broke out above this downtrend line that goes back to March, and now we're just back testing it. So the chart looks pretty constructive as from a trend perspective. We've maintained an uptrend in gold. Um, you can see this 2018 uptrend line, 
which coincided with their that horizontal support at 1675. We tested that last a uh, couple of weeks ago perfectly. Um, so I'm not sure if that answered that question specifically, but gold looks good from a technical perspective, but uh, the COT structure is not quite as bullish as that of silver. All right. And as we look at uh, the other metals as well, you've said that platinum is the only metal out there that could possibly outperform silver. What are you seeing in platinum right now? Yeah, platinum, it's much more speculative than silver or gold. It's not necessarily money, but from a, it is historically, historically undervalued relative to both gold and silver and basically all, all other commodities as well. If you look at a ratio chart here, I'll pull it up right now, of platinum versus gold. It is an anomaly for platinum to be less than the price of gold. Well, right now it's about half the price of gold. So I'm not sure that's ever happened before. I, I've gone back about 100 years and I've never seen platinum this undervalued. And I think all of the kind of bearish catalysts for platinum are more than priced in, but the potential bullish catalysts are almost being ignored. Like for example, uh, in this, uh, what do they call it? The Inflation Reduction Act. Um, regardless of what you think about that, there's provisions in there and you can see where the where the puck is headed and hydrogen fuel cell technology is going to be a thing. And mo big money is investing heavily into that technology, uh, both governments and uh, companies. And I'm saying all that because that technology uses a lot of platinum. Um, I don't think that's being accounted for. I don't think uh, that people are going to start or businesses are going to start substituting platinum for palladium is being uh, fully accounted for. We see that in Chinese import numbers. China is importing massive amounts of platinum. And I strongly suspect they're going to begin substituting uh, platinum for palladium. So all that say, you know, platinum is deeply undervalued, and I, I view it as a really good speculation right now. Now, we are also seeing uh, the mining shares in, you know, as we've seen this pullback, they've been hit pretty hard. Your perspective on the junior mi uh, silver mining sector right now? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, the, all of the miners are just beaten to a pulp. But what I like to do is take the whole precious metals complex and divide it up into six subcomponents. So physical gold, physical silver, senior gold miners, senior silver miners, junior silver miners, junior, junior gold miners. And of those six subcomponents, it's the junior silver miners that are the most undervalued. Uh, that's where the bargains are right now. And this is a chart showing SILJ versus GDX. And what we saw here is this bullish pattern. This is a bullish descending wedge. And junior silver miners broke out last week in a big way against their gold mining counterparts. And I think that's something that's very likely to continue. If we just get back to where we were in 2017, junior silver miners should outperform their gold mining counterparts by at least a factor of two and probably more than that. And when it comes to the the miners, why why is it that the junior miners can actually have more explosive moves than uh, the more senior miners? Uh, well, I think there's probably a lot of reasons, but one is leverage leverage to the the metal. Um, like for example, uh, let's let's just pick um, a stock. I think we'll use Pan American as an example. I think they're all in sustaining costs is around 18 bucks for an ounce of silver to pull an ounce out of the ground. And let's say silver's at 20, and then silver goes to 22. Yeah, silver moved two dollars, but their profit margins just doubled on a two dollar move in silver, a 10 percent move in silver. So that's why there's so much leverage built into these mining stocks. And that leverage, of course, cuts both ways, um, you know, in, as we've seen in the last few weeks or a few months, I should say. And when it comes to uh, the treasury yield, obviously, this is something that the Fed has been looking at. And obviously, when they raise the Fed funds rate, that has an impact. But your perspective on that right now and what it tells about uh, possible moves ahead for precious metals. Yeah. So first of all, it's real yields that matter the most. But you know, this is a chart of the nominal yield on the 10-year uh, treasury. It goes back 40 years. And what you can see here is we were the most overbought that we've been in four decades, right up against resistance. So what that tells me is we're very likely to see a pullback in yields. And I think that makes logical sense as well, because I think most of the Fed rate hike rhetoric is more than fully priced in already. Um, so if they do anything less than a 75 uh, uh, basis point rate hike next month, you know, I think yields are likely to fall, even though they're raising rates because it's already priced in. Um, so I'm looking for a pullback in yields, and that should be a further tailwind to uh, the metals and commodities in general. We did see the inflation number was actually did actually fall from the number in the previous month. So, you know, J July inflation or sorry, uh, June inflation was 9.1%. Uh, 
Uh, but July inflation ended up being 8.5%, which is a little bit of, uh, of a cool down there, not too much. But do you think this kind of, uh, I guess, good news is what could make the Fed maybe slow down and it's tightening? Um, I think that's a factor. Um, first of all, I could say so many things about those inflation numbers. Um, you know, if you measure it the same way you did back in the 70s, it's much higher. We're at record inflation. Um, but yeah, a period of disinflation or pullback in inflation is to be expected. Um, I've been saying for a long time, when the, ever the inflation deflation debate comes up, that the overall trend is going to be inflationary for the next handful of years, but there's going to be deflationary impulses along the way, for sure. Um, and uh, well, I'm sorry, you, you asked a specific question. I started kind of going off on a tangent. What, what was your specific question, Elijah? No, definitely. And it seems like what you're saying is that this is kind of just a bump along the road here. But do you think the Fed could use this uh, lower inflation number as an excuse to kind of slow down in, in its tightening and raising interest rates? Yes. Yeah. Back on track. Uh, so th- there's four reasons why I think the Fed has to pivot. And that is that's one of them. One, one of them, people talk about boosting asset prices. They don't want real estate to fall. They don't want the stock market to fall. All of these things. And those that's true. But what's also true is that the Fed must pivot, they must resume quantitative easing, because the government runs trillion dollar plus deficits into perpetuity. And who is going to fund that? Um, The private sector is not going to step in and fund uh, these deficits at these ridiculously low yields. I mean, sure, we've yields have risen, but they're still below inflation. Um, So someone has to fund that debt, uh, those deficits, China is stepping back, Saudi Arabia is stepping back, all these foreign buyers are stepping back. The Fed is going to be the buyer of last resort, and they cannot let interest rates run run rampant because on a $30 trillion national debt, let's say we return to 5% interest rates, that would be $1.5 trillion in interest expenses per year. We cannot afford that. Tax receipts are roughly, roughly $4 trillion. So that would consume over a third of all of our tax dollars would just go towards interest on the debt. And that's with a 5% interest rate. Um, so obviously, that mathematically cannot happen. And yields are, they're going to have to step in and intervene again. It's just a matter of time. When that happens, I don't know. My best guess is in the next few months. I think, it, you know, when people talk about a, a Powell pivot or a Fed pivot, that can mean a lot of different things to different people. You know, some people may define that as when they full up resume to quantitative easing and money printing again. That's probably more like six, seven, eight months out. But I consider the pivot when they start hinting that they're going to reverse course. So if they do a 50 basis point rate hike next month, I, I'd say that's right on the way to pivoting right there. And I think gold and silver will respond accordingly as the, they, they just start moving in that direction. Not necessarily, we don't have to wait until they resume full on quantitative easing again. Now, we also do see uh, the Inflation Reduction Act, as you mentioned your perspective on, will this have any impact on inflation? It seems almost, uh, I don't know, in some sense, it seems almost like, well, (laughs) are they actually going to reduce the amount of money they're creating and spending and stuff like that? But your perspective on all that? Yeah, when I heard the name of that act or bill or whatever, I already knew it was going to have the uh, opposite of its desired effect, because that's what government programs always do. Um, You know, go back and look at the Patriot Act. I think that's probably the most unpatriotic act we've ever had. Uh, The war on drugs, what's happened since then? Well, drug use has skyrocketed. Uh, We created, um, uh, you know, you know, the, the government tried to reduce oil prices back in the 70s. Well, what have they done? <laughs> My point is, whenever the government tries to do something, you can bet your bottom dollar it always has the exact opposite of that desired effect. And of course, you know, this is going to increase deficits and increase the need for the government or for the Federal Reserve to print more currency, which is going to be inflationary. Definitely. I think kind of getting back to one of the viewers' questions that we covered of like, why own physical precious metals is because of that. Because, you know, it's having something outside of the system that can't, you know, the the price, the paper price may be able to be manipulated, but no one can change what's in your hand. I think that's so important. And no one can inflate it away, right? Just increase the supply uh, of it you know, it has to be mined. You have to put effort into that to create more gold or silver. Can you expand on that, your perspective on really owning physical precious metals? Yeah. I mean, what we're seeing uh, in governments around the world, specifically here in the United States is nothing new. It's not, there's nothing new under the sun. You can go back millennia. And I think Mike Maloney calls it the seven stages of empire. And we're clearly in that sixth, seventh stage. And 
governments, you know, promise more than they can deliver on. Um, they don't have enough tax receipts to cover their obligations. And then what happens? They debase the currency. It happens every single time over and over and over again without fail. And without fail, silver and gold are the prime beneficiaries of that exact environment. So could it be different this time? Maybe, but you can find zero precedent in all of you know economic history where that where they weren't. So this is the time I think to have some. I'm not saying hey, go all in, sell everything, and go all in on silver. But if I didn't have any right now that I could touch, um, you know, I would want to rectify that as soon as possible. And it is interesting how we're seeing a lot of the big money, as we mentioned at the top of this interview, uh, moving into precious metals, reducing their short positions. Could you kind of just leave us with your last thoughts on that, that COT report that we talked about at the top of the interview? And it seems like, yeah, the big money is really (laughs) buying silver hand over fist, as you mentioned. Yeah, it's a sad reality that unfortunately, the average retail investor buys at the exact worst time and they sell at the exact worst time. You've got smart money and dumb money. And, you know, back in March, uh, when gold was up near record highs, that's when the average retail person was buying hand over fist. And now we're, we've pulled back and, you know, people hate it. Um, just go on social media. People hate silver and gold right now. That's the time to be buying. Um, I don't know about you, but I, I like to follow the smart money. Um, there's, they're, they're smarter than I am. And, you know, the smart money is buying right now. And, you know, I'm, I'm trying to follow in their lead. All right. And for all our viewers who enjoyed uh, this live stream today, please go to silverchartistliberty.com, silverchartistliberty.com. If you'd like to just click the link instead, the link is in the description of this video to sign up uh, for Steve's free newsletter. Uh, And then, yeah, you'll be also supporting uh, Liberty and Finance along the way if you like what's there and also end up subscribing uh, for the premium newsletter there. Did you want to share with us um, your uh, newsletter? I think one of the fantastic things that I like about it is that it's a complete like uh, open book, right? They actually are able to see your entire portfolio. And I think that's just so, so key there. Yeah, I think that's w- what's unique. I call it a fully transparent over the shoulder service with real time alert. So I'm fully transparent. I show members exactly what I buy when I buy it. And I send out an alert whenever I make a change to the portfolio. That doesn't mean I do everything perfectly correct. Um, but, you know, hopefully that full transparency helps people to make better decisions in their own financial life. All right. Well, Steve Penny, thank you so much for your time today and God bless. Thanks, Elijah.